everybody. Welcome to Phonogenics 101. I'm here with my Joni Mitchell friends. Uh, once a month, we're talking about a Joni Mitchell album. Uh, before we get into the discussion, I'd like to thank all my Patreon subscribers, even for a dollar a month. This is helping me not wait tables and do music discussions instead. Uh, in addition to my day, uh, my full-time job. So Joni Mitchell, I've been a fan since 1989. And y'all weren't in the first one, but I discovered Joni Mitchell through Prince. Because I was a big Prince fan. And he had a song, Ballad of Dorothy Parker, where he sang a line from Help Me. So then I heard the real Help Me on the radio. I'm like, this, this is the song from the Prince song. <laughs> I was at a flea market and I found Chalk Mark and a Rainstorm. So the first Joni Mitchell album I ever heard was Chalk Mark and a Rainstorm. That's amazing. That's a weird place to start, but that's still one of my favorite albums. I know a lot of people don't love it, but I, that's going to be like a th five hour episode because I love that album. <laughs> So then I went back and bought all the other albums. And tonight we're going to be talking about her second album, which is Clouds. Clouds. Um, do you all want to introduce yourselves and talk a little bit about your, your history of being a Joni fan? Sure. And I got to say really quick to the whole world watching, it's Sue's birthday today. So. <laughs> <laughs> Wish Sue a happy 21st. Tell us, tell us about you. Well... My name's Sue Tierney. I uh, grew up on Long Island, and um, I remember very vividly sitting on my little bed in um, my bedroom in uh, Long Island when I was maybe 14 or 15, and I had a little FM radio that got a, um, a college station from uh, Bridgeport, Connecticut over the sound, and one day I was sitting there, and I heard uh, Blue, the album I, I'm pretty sure it was the song Blue, but um, also uh, they played a couple of tunes from Blue, and I was like, wow, that's great. So that's the first time I actually heard a Joni Mitchell song, and um, so I borrowed a couple of albums from my friends, and I listened to, um, um, you know, Ladies of the Canyon, and then I found... Um, a song to a seagull at my aunt's house. <laughs> of course, I'm young, you know, so I thought, wow, Joni's coming out for, with a new album. I'm going to finally buy an album, but I realized I had my Christmas money. So instead of buying it for myself, I bought it for my mother for Christmas, Aww. which nobody in the house thought that my mother was a Joni Mitchell fan. <laughs> but I bought her Court and Spark, and Court and Spark was really my favorite album of um, that early period of Joni. Uh, I just, I just thought that was the best album. And, you know, it was funny when I think back on it, there were a lot of my other favorite albums during that time were albums that were playing um, like a jazz flavored type of music, like uh, Bette Midler's Divine Miss M. And there was another, I'm, I'm trying to think of another album, but there, you know, it was just, it was just uh, that whole um, kind of big band sound was really popular. I don't know. It was getting it like a resurgence. Yeah, didn't the LA Express and Tom Scott weren't they kind of session musicians on a lot of yeah, albums? Yeah, yeah, they were on the album. Yeah, and they played they played all that. Uh, so, um, but I have to talk about um, my whole guitar journey, if if you don't mind. Yes, uh, please do. So, um, so I, you know, I got all of Joni's albums. I was a big fan, and then when the '80s hit, I got married and I I moved. Um, I was living in, in Queens, and and I just didn't. I didn't collect the, the albums after um, Shadows and Light, you know? Okay. And um, I, you know, I got a job. I, we moved up to Ithaca and I got a job and I was, it was probably like 89, 90. And I heard that she had a new album out, but I didn't get it. Right. But then I heard of when Turbulent Indigo came out. I got excited again. And then I got Night Ride Home and I was like so thrilled and, I tried to play the songs, you know. I I did play a little bit guitar, and I had a couple of um, easy for guitar Joni Joni uh, sheet music books, but I couldn't figure out what the heck was going on. I couldn't even get close to playing this stuff, right? So I was at work one day, and they put a computer on my desk, and I could get the internet, right? This is like '93, right? And the first, of course, and, and so many of my friends in, in Joni land say the first thing they typed in when they got onto the search engine was Joni Mitchell, right? And this, uh, this list came up of Joni Mitchell's tunings. Ooh. 
And this was such a revelation to me. So it was like, oh my God, that's why I can't play her music because she's playing them in all these different tunings, right? So I found another website where they were transcribing different albums. You know, they called it the, um, the guitar, the, the online guitar archive. So the nickname for it was Olga. And you can go there and get all these sheet music, right? And I found this one guy called Howard Wright who transcribed a lot of Joni Mitchell songs. I mean, the first one I pulled out was People's Parties. And I started Ooh. playing that song and I felt like my fairy, grand, my fairy godmother hit me with a wand. I mean, it was just, I was like, this is it. And for the next couple of years, I just tried to transcribe as many songs as I could find. And I, I also hooked up with uh, Wally Breeze, who had the first Joni Mitchell.com mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, website. And we used to, he lived in San Francisco. We used to talk on the phone all the time. And I said to him, I go, I really want to post some of my transcriptions of Joni. And he's like, no, no, we can't do that. It's a copyright thing, right? Mm -hmm. So I made up a little page, like a web page with my transcriptions. And unfortunately, sadly, Wally passed away from cancer right in like 2000 that. and the, and Les Irvin was the person who started up who who you know took over the reins for johnnymitchell.com and he was all over it with the uh with the transcriptions he thought this thing was great so we created the Joni Mitchell guitar database amazing and I and feel it, like that wouldn't be a copyright issue, transcriptions, you know what I mean? Yeah, because we just made them up ourselves. It wasn't like we were taking it because yeah. she didn't she didn't print any of her her uh, sheet music the way that, you know, it was written. Right. I mean, I mean, the way that she did it with the tunings. There were only, like, For the Roses was really the only sheet music book that I remember that actually had all the real tunings in it. Okay. So, um, so it was also... You know, later on, I, I realized it was one of the first crowdsourcing archives because it wasn't just me and Howard. It was also all these other people all over the Internet who were also obsessed with Joni Mitchell's music. And they would send us all their transcriptions. And within like four or five years, we transcribed most of her, um, her uh, you know, songs. I mean, we even had bootlegs of stuff that she never recorded that we had transcribed, <laughs> you know? <laughs> Which is finally going to start coming out, right? With the... Uh, I know the, the archive. archive set. Oh my God, that thing's so beautiful. Oh, I know. So, so anyway, you know, we're... Let's get back to Clouds, you know, because uh, Clouds became the first um, album that I wanted to do instructional videos for. So, so I started... you, you play guitar then and sing? Oh yeah, 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 I do. So I feel like we should end every episode with you doing one of the songs from the from the album we're discussing. I think that'd be fun. Well, you know, it's funny. I um, <laughs> I I have been practicing that song about the midway. So I mean, I could play a little bit of that if you want. Yes, let's end the we'll end the episode okay. with a. Okay. How yeah. fun! I love traditions. I feel a new tradition coming on. If, yeah, that sounds great. <laughs> how fun! Um, so. Cool. So I'll, I'll end it there. You know, that's that's pretty much uh, my deal as far as the Joni stuff. Well, I'm so glad to meet you. I feel I feel like I've known you my whole life, <laughs> but we just met now. David, tell us about yourself. Sure. So, um, like Sue, I, she started telling my story. Um, I too had a little little FM radio, <laughs> and you know it was the alarm clock, and you could set the sleep timer so it played for twenty minutes before you went to sleep. And it, it was um, it had to be seventy, I guess, whenever Blue came out. And um, I was drifting off to sleep, and they played All I Want, Ooh. and I, I I never turned back. <laughs> it just it it just grabbed me, and I just thought, who is this? Um, and, uh, so Blue was the first album I ever owned. Um, my, my mother promised me that if I got, uh, if I did well on my SATs, she would buy me an album and, uh, and Blue, Blue was that album. So, so yeah, I must have been 15, um, and, um, and I also want to say that that this. Uh, so I just listened to Clouds again uh, last night, 
And it takes me back to such a place. And especially with the early Joni, um, so much of it is about being a, a 15 year old sort of gay maybe boy, ah, you know? Um, and, and so much of it, it was this, you know, in retrospect, it, it's both, it's just it's gorgeous. It's just so beautiful. Yeah. Um, and also she's singing about yearning for the love of men. And I really think that was, that was part of it that, that just hooked me. Um, same here. <laughs> so, yes. Yeah. So, um, uh, so anyway, so I, I became a, <laughs> of that first year. Um, and I really was kind of obsessed and remain kind of obsessed with, uh, Joni. Um, and my, my sort of relationship to the obsession has really changed in uh, 1996 or 97 when the JMDL list, uh, uh, the, the mailing list um, happened. Um, and I found, I found my community, I found my fans, found, like, people who understood, you know? It was so great, it was so wonderful um, because I, I, would, I wasn't exactly closeted about being a Journey fan, but, but no one got it. No one got that. <laughs> you know, but I love her. I love her. <laughs> um, so, uh, so it was great to, to be with people who did, um, who did get that. Um, and so anyway, I started with Blue um, as quickly as I could, went, went back to the, the back catalog, which is, you know, at that point, you know, three other albums. Um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll just, I'll, I'll just leave it there. I, and I've just picked up every album as it's come out since, you know, since then. Um, and, uh, and go and, <laughs> and love being with people who love Joni. Oh, that's yeah. awesome. So yeah, when I when I was fifteen, or well, I, I guess I came to Joni when I was seventeen, but I definitely had a a clouds heart where I was very yearning for the love of men. I'd say I now have a turbulent indigo heart where I think all men are terrible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, so we Ruben, Joni, you know, she has the lyrics for anything. <laughs> Ruben, welcome to the chat. Everyone's kind of just telling their story of how they came into Joni Mitchell, and then uh, if you like to share with us that'd be awesome yeah i'm i'm so glad you're doing this thanks for putting these together and i'm sorry i missed the first one um i got into Joni. my mother had a vinyl copy of ladies of the canyon that i listened to i remember sitting on the floor with the record player looking at the cover and reading the lyrics i was probably a, i was in must have been about kindergarten based on where we were where i was sitting and what house i was sitting in and all these years later i realized i liked it because there was there was it was sweet music but there was this underlying just melancholy to the whole thing that really resonated with me as a little kid i have no idea why and um i just i've carried that record around with me forever ever since then and then i the first Joni album that i heard new was wild things run fast and it my mom bought that one. I remember we had that one on a cassette and um, those were the only two she ever had as far as I know. And I loved wild things run fast as a kid. It's still it's, I'm one of the unusual Joni fans that puts that one way up at the top of my list. I love that record. That's how and I am with chalk marking and rainstorm. So I feel like uh, me too. <laughs> well, see then at that point, as, as I'm in the eighties, I was listening to a lot of, um, you know, Kate Bush and Peter Gabriel oh, and yeah. those kind of people. So dog eat dog and chalk mark didn't sound terribly different from other stuff that I was listening to. And it wasn't because I, I was listening to Joni, I was going through the catalog kind of backwards and out of sequence. So they didn't, they weren't as jarring to me as they were, I think, to people who'd been following her chronologically for many years. That must have, I, I can imagine how, how those turns must have felt at the time when they were new. Um, that must have been hard, but um, I like, I love the eighties Joni stuff. Um, my least favorite. And I, I say that kind of lightly because I, I still love them 
are the first four actually. Um, aside from Ladies of the Canyon, um, the only the only album of hers I don't routinely go back to, and I I listen to a lot of music. I listen to music in the car. I listen to music at home. The only one I don't go back to a lot is Blue for some reason. That one never out of all of the records, that one never had captivated me. I don't know why, and I, I'm I'm always hesitant to even mention that because that's the one, you know. Um, but the I, the first album, it's funny with the first four. Um, aside, I keep ladies aside because that's kind of, kind of a special place. Clouds is the one that I go back to the most. There, there are some really fantastic songs on there, and I, I've always felt like um, I don't know where I stand, and I think I understand are kind of like a, a a couple for me. I can't hear one without hearing the other, and I. It's funny. I had a experience about six months ago. I was in a a meeting, and somebody quoted. Um, I can't remember which one it was. Fear is like a wilderland, stepping stones and sinking sand. I think I understand. And they were using that as an example. And they said, yeah, this Joni Mitchell said this. And I listened, I was like, whoa, how many times have I sung that in my head and yeah. listened to that? But when it put in this other context, I was like, oh, this is why I love Joni Mitchell. So, yeah, it's good. I'm, I'm going to say something controversial also since you opened the can of worms that I think Chalk Market and Rainstorm is a much better album than Blue. I, I would agree with you on that. I, I, it's although I would say it's really hard to compare the two. Listen, uh, but I'm I on think, the highway listening to Lakota. I'm, I think the more volume turned up. Me too. I think it's a much more interesting album than Blue. But it, like I said, it's apples to oranges. Well, we love. Yeah, I love. I do love Blue. So I guess that's two months from now. We're skip, it's Blue, hard not to Blue, spot, skip all over the whole discography. Blue has grown on me. And actually, I listened to Blue more during the quarantine than I have ever before. And I, I, I started to finally get it. I think for some reason, others just struck me more. I think if I had to pick a favorite period, it would be like Hissing Through Mingus. I love the Mingus oh, album. Yeah. I know that's not a hugely popular one. It's a weird record. But I, I listen to Mingus way more than I listen to even Ladies of the Canyon. I, I've heard it so many times. And last year when those um, Mingus um, alternate oh, tape yeah. came out, I never, ever thought I would hear those. Those have been just up in the cloud somewhere. I, I never thought they would ever come to light. I was thrilled to hear those. So, I wonder if those will be on the archives. The ones I hope so. I hope so. I almost wanted to play the Mingus happy birthday intro. <laughs> 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 um, well, uh, we, we're getting uh, two months ahead, but I do want to say, so Ruben, <laughs> have you read um, an article that Zadie Smith uh, wrote? She, she's a novel. She wrote White Teeth. She wrote a couple other things. And she would listen, you know, somebody would play Blue on the radio and she'd say, ew, 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 until one day she went, oh. Oh my God! <laughs> and it's a great, it's a, it's a great. Audio. I think it was in the New Yorker. I'm not sure, but it's Zadie, Zadie Smith wrote it, and it's about her, her suddenly appreciating. I'll have to check that out. Um, the singer that uh, Brandy Carlisle said something similar in an interview about how oh, yes. her girlfriend really liked Blue and she hated it, and she was talking about that line and. All I want, where she says, "I want to shampoo you," and I remember the first time I heard that, and it just grated on me. So I did like, yes, that. I understand what you mean, except I haven't gotten over it yet. <laughs> um, I was gonna say, oh, I hosted an open mic for like twenty-five years, so I just heard so many bad versions of a case of you because you know if someone's gonna play a Joni song, like they show up with their guitar, then they play, so it's like. I'm the kind of person like I had to be a rebel, so I, you know, I can't love the Joni Mitchell album that everyone loves. I know that's how I feel about it too. <laughs> but you know, when we talk about Blue in two months, of course, we know it's an iconic album, and we'll get there'll be a thousand album. people on that Zoom. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, tonight it was uh, this album came out in 1969, correct? So this was Joni Mitchell's second album. It always struck me because Joni's first album, Joni Mitchell, or Song to a Seagull, uh, is very airy, a lot of curly cues in the artwork, a lot of arpeggios in the music. And with Clouds, I feel like she really just tightened up her songwriting, the production, even her artwork style changed to a much more direct uh, look and sound. So 
I love this album. It's it's a it's a simple album, but very complex also. So I guess uh, let's just jump into the track listing. The album opens with a song called Chin Angel, which is the only song that's produced by somebody else, correct? Was it Tin Angel? Yeah, that's the first track. Let me take a look. What, what, read the track list. I don't have it in front yes. of me. Uh, Tin Angel, produced by Paul Rothschild, who oh. produced a lot of the Doors stuff, I believe. Hmm. So it's interesting because I feel like all he really did is put a little reverb on her voice. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I don't feel like it's particularly produced either. I'm not yeah. a musician and I'm not a producer, but it doesn't. If I had to pick a song, that wouldn't have been it that had somebody else's hand on. It's not like David Crosby with the first album where, you know. Um, so I wonder what Paul Rothschild. Gonna... Oh, what's that, Sue? Oh, no, I was just going to say the thing that uh, <laughs> we may not hear what went on there, but Joni didn't like to be produced. Right. So, so I think that's why it graded on her and, you know, the song, I mean, is not that different from the way she played it um, on, on earlier recordings that were never released. Like there's a release, there's a recording of that that was on um, the archives, I'm pretty sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and she played it the same way, but she didn't like this, the, the way that he treated her as, you know, as as he was trying to produce it like he was trying to really contain her and mm. she didn't like it so so she never had a producer after that well i'm, her, I'm glad her, it didn't work out with those two because yeah <laughs> I, I think Joni and henry was all you really needed you know what i mean yeah yeah, yeah. So i wonder if this was the first song recorded for the album and then he produced it and everything went south so she just did the rest of the album it's i think weird. that's true i think it is i, I, I think, think it is too one of the books said that they did that one and then Ross Trout had to go do something else for a week or something. So they quick finished it, finished the rest of it before he got back and said, ah, we're done. <laughs> I think that was in the, the recent biography. Yeah, it might have been a reckless daughter. Yeah. yeah. That's such a Joni thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> and he came back, that's, all the album's done. That And that's what I like about this album too. That's such a it's a lovely song, but it sounds like she's singing it like on the way to the guy's funeral. It's such a such a dirge. It's a dirge. It's a great yeah. lyric, and it's but it's, it's so sad at the same yeah. time. But that's what I love about those early records, especially. Do you all feel like this was an interesting choice to start the album? You know what I mean? Like it's such a slow. Yeah. It, yeah. Oh, I have to be it, and say that I always skip this. <sighs> Really, oh, right. Right. Drake, Chelsea, That's one of my favorites. Yeah. Oh, wow. I always I, I, I got, you know when I got a new appreciation for it when I tried to learn it myself on guitar. Hmm. Huh. It's really hard. I mean, it's one of the only songs she uh, she recorded in um, in concert tuning, okay. in the regular hmm. standard tuning, and um, it's very it's a very precise picking. I almost felt like I was trying to learn harp. When I was, you know, huh. trying to learn the song, it was it was it's pretty it's pretty intense and um and it was very structured. Yeah. And I think it was part of that whole thing that they were talking about when she uh, like from her first album, this whole idea that she was like she liked child ballads and it was very um, like you know Gilbert and Sullivan type mm. of stuff, you know. And um, it kind of harkened back to that time. Because it was one of her earlier compositions. Yeah. A lot of her earlier compositions that were really good were skipped on Song to a Seagull because she had that concept idea about S Song to a Seagull. So yeah, we talked about that last month. Like, I'm not a huge fan of Sisso Tobel Lane. I'm like, yeah. how, how did that go on the album over Chelsea yeah. Moore? Right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's a great song. A Teenage Angel right. is a really beautiful song. I, I, the lyrics. I do love this. I do love this song, and, and um, I I love it both be, both because it's it's that dark dark romantic you know that that that, that romantic pessimism sadness kind of thing yeah. that I love so much, <laughs> um, and also um, the thing that just recurs over and over and over again is to, I'm, I'm, I can't speak in musical terms. I'm not, I'm not really a musician, but there's this openness 
and the and the un that, that it's unresolved. It seems to me like all the way through. So I, it, it's like what you know all the way through it. Um, so uh, so anyway, uh, I like it. I also love the way that it goes into uh, Chelsea Morning. It's like uh, <laughs> it, it, just, it harkens forward to to blue. Actually, where Carrie Carrie goes into blue, <laughs> like <Okay>. whoa, your womb. <laughs> you know? So, uh, but I think this is I think it's a great uh, song to open the album with because because it it has that. Um, Sadness, sad, sadness, and love. You know that, 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 that. So anyway, I like it. The the dark with darker moods is he like? Oh, been there, been there, done that. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Not the no golden prince. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, you might relate to the fact that I always fell in love with moody poets. <laughs> <laughs> that might have been Joni's fault too. Yeah, I think it was. <laughs> I like the fact too that she can sing like some of those lyrics would have been hokey uh, if somebody else had sung them, but she sings them with such um, sort of serious conviction about, you know, the roses and sealing wax and sort of these yeah. cliche kind of ideas. But when, when she sings them, it's like, Oh yeah, I know exactly what you mean. But I, I really like this one. And on that first album, she really wasn't that high soprano. This song kind of brings out that lower voice that Joni. She really didn't use this voice too much on the first album, I don't think. Yeah. So, all right. Any uh, any thoughts on Tin Angel before we move on? Oh, there is. You might probably already all know this, but there is. I, I live in Maine. I'm from Maine, but I lived in Philadelphia for about 15 years. And there's a club, a music club called Tin Angel in Philadelphia that's mm-hmm. named after this. And I will say, uh, when I was in New York City, because I'm a musician, I was playing a show, and I, I was on Bleecker Street. Uh, so I'm like, oh, I'm in the, I'm at a Bleecker Street cafe. <laughs> right. yeah. it's, it's now the Bleecker Street boutique. <laughs> uh, the John Barbados flagship store on Bleecker Street. <laughs> I'm a big Prince fan, and one of his protégés, Jill Jones, had a song 7-7 Bleecker Street, so I was like, I had two reasons to be there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so all right well moving on to chelsea morning i will just say like i love this song mm. like sometimes if i'm feeling like in a little bit of a bad mood i put on a little chelsea morning it really does kind of put me in a good mood mm-hmm. uh yeah bill clinton named his daughter after the song bill and yeah. hillary correct yeah. yeah um yeah so i i have a um just because I, I read this on the on the website yesterday on, on JoniMitchell.com. I, I did my did my lit review before showing up. Um, so uh, the um, where what's the line? You know the the sun the the sun poured in like butterscotch. The the um, green blue red green and gold the crimson crystals. Um, when she first sang it, the story the story of that was that they were tearing down a home for unwed mothers that had stained glass windows in it. And she bought some of these stained glass windows from the sum of unwed mothers and she put them in her apartment. Later, the story was, well, I was playing in Philadelphia and uh, there in this uh, back alley, there were all these colored pieces of glass. So I picked them up and made a mobile out of them and put them in my my window. And I just thought, now that's interesting. I don't know if you find it interesting as well, but there it is. You know? I love all the tidbits. I live for this. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I really think it's interesting that this whole that the whole unwed mother part just no, 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 no. He didn't talk about that too much. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Not till 90, 98, right or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Ninety-seven, yeah, ninety-seven. Yeah. But I love this song too, except for the image the sun pouring in like butterscotch and sticking to my sucker. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I like butterscotch, so pour it on me. Please, me. <laughs> I, like the, I like the next line that says, "and and let's uh, let's spend the day and talk in present tenses." Oh, I yeah, love yeah. that line. I mean, that's so cool. You know, it's just like totally what you know when you're happy and you don't mind being yeah. the exact yeah. moment. You know, yeah, because the music of Joni and her lyrics. You'll hear a lyric that you haven't heard in years, and it'll like hit you like, "Oh shit!" Yeah, I haven't yeah. heard that line in a long time. And I'm like, 
I spend so much time like living in the past. Like, let's speak in present tense. And so I love that line. I'm glad you said it. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to take the advice of Chelsea Morning after I get off this meeting here. <laughs> what is it? Does anyone else have any thoughts on this song? Well, I guess I have to say that it's an open D and um, it's in the same tuning as both sides now. And uh, it's one of the first couple songs that I transcribed uh, for the. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just incredible uh, how she uses some of like, you know, the beginning, the intro to the song is uh, these these chord shapes down near the uh, 12th and 13th fret that just sounds so great. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just comes in and do it. You know, it's like it's like a trumpet, you know, or or you know, a little woodwind, you know, just opening it up. And she always thought orchestrally when she right. when she wrote her her compositions, and it's just amazing what she got out of it. You know, that tuning helped her to to get these um, these compositions that you know uh, were full. That it wasn't just a chord that she was singing to; it was like a whole background, you know. And and that song is just so so much fun to play. I bet it's, it's so fun to listen to. And you know what? I love those little harm the little do 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 that she puts at the end. I think they're so yeah, cute. Right. Oh yeah, this singing, yeah, yeah, the little scat. Yeah. That they call yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a great song. That's actually one of my favorite things about Joni when you look at all the albums are those really interesting background. Yeah. Um, with very interesting vowel sounds that you, I, you I'd love to have I'd love to be able to pull those out and listen to those separately mm -hmm. without the main vocal I think she did some really neat stuff even all the way up through the 80s mm -hmm. uh, with all that there's you, you mentioned Lakota before there's some really neat background vocals on Lakota yeah if, if you put, put your ear the right, right way I feel like I'm Gordon Spark there's yeah. so many layers in there that you I like mm -hmm. to harmonize with albums, yeah. and you can. There's like ten different ones you can pick. <laughs> Car in a Hill. Oh man, Car in a Hill has such great. I mean, it's crazy how great yeah. the vocals are on there. That's one of those things. Like when I hear that, I start crying because I'm so, <laughs> so powerful. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I have to actually. I have to be careful with Court and Spark because it, it. I get in a weird, uh, not a bad frame of mind, but I. I like. I can't just put it on. And go about what I'm doing. I have to like sit and listen to it, and it sort of changes my mood. I, it's funny. It's a funny it's an experience. Yeah. It is. Well, yeah. I feel like with Chelsea Morning, it's not like the deepest song in the world. It's just kind of you know about a Chelsea morning, and I think it's it's sunny, it's bright, it's it's a Chelsea morning. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Does anyone else have any thoughts on this song before we move on to the next one? All right. Well, the third song is uh, I don't know where I stand. Which, you know, it's it's kind of a simple guitar and voice song, but it's also I feel like it has a lot of emotional complexity. So, yeah, I I, I love this one too. Um, again, it's it's simple. It's um, I I think the, the it, it, and it really captures that emotional moment of should I, you know. Yeah. <laughs> It's interesting. I feel like none of these songs would have fit on the first album. Like this definitely, every one of her albums has such a unique sound, even with just the guitar and voice. Like the set of songs that song to a seagull is so different than the set of songs that is clouds. I feel like. I Which think so too. I, these are more um, f uh, first person, I think, mm -hmm. than clouds. clouds was, I mean, the first one was more characters, uh, character driven to me. Was this the album where in an interview she said she doesn't like to listen to it because she felt like she was trying to copy the harmonies of Cosby Stills and Nash? I think so. Like I think she, it might, yeah. she heard the she heard the inflection when she was listening to like her background parts. Yeah, it might been. And I always thought that was an interesting thing because I'm I'm totally okay with Joni doing her take on Cosby Stills and Nash. <laughs> well, it been song? hard. I think this song was uh, played uh, was written before she went to um, California, though, because she um, uh, when when she sang that in the clubs when she first wrote it, she it was not you know here I am in California, it was here I am in Carolina. Okay. Yeah. Oh really? Yeah, yeah. Right, I remember so hearing she, that. She yes. Wrote it, yes. She wrote it when she was down there, probably early '67 or something, before she went to California, hmm. and um. You know, for me, this song is like one of her in 
really beautiful standards, you know. Yeah. You know, like you have a couple songs, like later on she did, um, you know, the standard albums and the orchestral albums. This song, really, really. I mean, I, I, when I was doing my instructional video, I said I call this uh, uh, trumpet concerto in, in F, you know, because it's just like this. You know, she even talked about oh, yeah. why she wrote this, why she wrote the music for her father, because that scat in the middle of the song is what she considered her trumpet solo. Oh. So that was uh, this song. I was trying to remember if that was this one or not. It yeah, was this. Yeah. One. Yeah, I don't know where I stand, you know. And it so does sound like a trumpet. Like when you listen yeah. back to it in that context, you're like, that right. is the trumpet solo. It's so beautiful. And it's, I mean, it's a, it's done in a different tuning too. It's an F tuning, which is also the song that Michael from Mountains was written with okay. the same tuning. And um, I don't know how she does it, man. She gets these beautiful chords coming out of these tunings that are, um, you know, just hit you right in the, in the heart. They know? really do. I mean, the first time, about it. it's crazy. The first time I heard um, Michael from Mountains was actually Judy Collins' version. Mm. And I knew, I heard it on the radio when I was a kid, and I knew it was a Joni song. I just hadn't heard the Joni one yet. And even, even with somebody else covering it in a much more sort of, poppy way you that that emotion is still under there you can't it, right. it's just in there somehow i don't know mm -hmm. yeah, great song too. um it's, did barbara streisand <laughs> covered this yes and it, yeah. and it's it's really amazing i guess she had an album where she covered this and also stony in maybe stony in. Yeah. Girl, you know interesting <laughs> But um, I don't know. I find the song to be very symphonic, even though it's mm -hmm. played on guitar. You know, <laughs> that's actually the only Barbara Streisand album I ever bought because of the the cover. <laughs> I'm, bad, I'm a bad gay. I don't like Barbara, but you um, like Wet or whatever the one where she has like <laughs> the disco one. <laughs> it's Funny. interesting because the first Joni album, Sandra Seagull. Like her albums kind of have like a feeling to me. And the first one really felt like you're standing by the sea and you could feel the mist on kind of on your face. This album clouds to me feels like a foggy forest. Like you're just kind of like, even the song, the way it's recorded, like it's just so foggy and. Yeah, I, I could see that. It's not a, it's not a sunny, happy record at all. Mm -hmm. um, to me. I know over at the record company, they're like, Joni, we need one happy song in there. So she put Chelsea morning. <laughs> yeah, right here's one. <laughs> yeah, here we go. Um, all right. Well, any, any other thoughts on uh, I don't know where I stand? All right. Well, we're moving on. That song about the midway, which was covered by Bonnie Raitt, correct? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I actually right. like her version. <laughs> that might be my favorite Joni cover ever. Yeah. Is the Bonnie Raitt cover of this? That is a great cover. Because I knew the Joni one first, and then I went back and collected Bonnie Raitt's Ooh. albums, and I'm like, "How's she gonna pull this off?" But then mm -hmm. when I heard it, I'm like, "This is." And she did it different than Joni's version. Doesn't she have a full band behind her? Mm -hmm. It's as good, I think. Yeah, I, I'm really picky about this. Bob does all those great. Uh, I don't. Covers, I can't listen. I don't particularly like Joni's version. Really? I don't particularly like this song. Do you? Mm -hmm. Do you like the Bonnie Raitt version or no version? I, I like the Bonnie Raitt version better. Um, there's there's something about her voice, uh, uh, Joni's voice as she's singing it. it, it. Some people say Joni Quines, and when I listen when I listen to this, I hear it. Um, and so it just it just doesn't really do it for me. No? Yeah. That's mm. fair because I, I feel sometimes that it's not my favorite song either, but it's just, there's something about, um, I guess, the lyrics that I really like. Yeah. You know, and, it, and, it, and it kind of reminds me of her time doing the uh, festival circuit mm -hmm. when she was, um, like in this, when she met Judy Collins and she met Leonard Cohen and was going through all those uh, festivals and, uh, and her feeling about it, you know, it's like, it's like she, that whole uh, that whole thing where she goes, it was get, she was getting very depressed by it, which I, I find is interesting. Maybe she felt like it was too much of a uh, 
meat market in a way, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Makes sense. It is kind yeah, of. I mean, I mean, that's why the song is a little weird because it's like, here she is becoming famous, but there was something, she was always had that melancholy tinge to everything. Mm -hmm. you know what I liked about this song is I felt like her vocal performance is very confident. Like she kind of belts it out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I always really enjoyed that about the song. This is another one, like if I'm driving in the car, I'm hopefully no one pulls up to me next to the stoplight because I'm waiting along. With the <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point, though. I never thought about it that way. It is, it is a kind of a, a more forceful vocal. I feel like it's a it's the first yeah. time she sold that kind of confidence. Like if you start with mm -hmm. Sandra yeah. Siegel and mm -hmm. you get to this song, she's really belting it out. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's what I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think, but uh, it is something about her tone of voice. Yeah. It, you know, it just doesn't, it just bugs me for most of it. Although I love them. The, the lyrics are lovely and the images are, are lovely. And, you know, and I want to say, Joy Mitchell's a bloody fucking genius and all that. So I, I don't want to diss her. It's, a, it's the work of a genius. But, Right. And of course, you know, I think that's what's great about music is there's things that touch people and things don't. So there's really no right or wrong on it. Although uh, my statement about chalk mark being better than blue may get a lot of thumbs down on YouTube. That can be right in your world. <laughs> I just want to say one other thing is that uh, she only, she only, I've only heard one other version of this song, her playing it, and that was on that James Taylor um, hmm. bootleg. The green oh, piece. Right. So she never really played it again. I mean, mm. so maybe she mm. didn't really, it wasn't really, you know, it was just good for that one time, but, you know, it wasn't the type of song that made it through her catalog, you know, no. for she was playing it like it right. was through the 70s. It kind of dropped off. When did, uh, when did Bonnie cover it? It was on street. So that, she might have just let Bonnie have it, kind of. Right. <laughs> kind of yeah. I think it was 70, early 70s. Yeah. yeah. 74, it, wasn't that long, it wasn't that long after this was. Um, yeah. Um, I had a point, but I lost it. <laughs> it was a busy day at work today. Um, you got 18 more albums to find it. <laughs> yeah. I know it was on the album Streetlights, I believe. It wasn't it the opening track for the Bonnie Raid? So it's like. So, yeah. Here, I'm going to look it up. Streetlights, Bonnie. Let's see what year that was. My guess is 74, but I could be wrong. That sounds good. Mm, yeah, sure. I'll go with seventy four too. <laughs> Bonnie writes somebody that I'm not overly familiar with her whole catalog either. I've had I have a couple of albums from here and there, and she's she's fantastic. You know, but I just don't know that that familiar with her. It was a uh, seventy four. So seventy four. Cool. Mm. Well, any uh, any thoughts on that song? Oh, I did. So, does anyone know? Was this song current to this album? Was this a song that she'd written? For this wasn't something that she brought along from the past, right? No, she no, I'm pretty sure that she wrote it pretty late, like into like 69, 68, 69. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I, I, I don't have it, there's no other version of her playing it that I know of before the album, and then that bootleg that she did with James Taylor in 1970. Right. Mm. Mm -hmm. Cool. Well, we're moving on to the final song of Side One, which I feel is kind of the uh, pirate of penance of the album, where she gets a little, <laughs> she gets a little darker. She's getting into the occult a little bit. She has a weird mandolin at the end, which kind of scared me a little bit when I was home alone. <laughs> so the song is Rose is Blue, and she's talking about a, a medium in this song, right? Yeah. Rose is the character, so she's back to like the characters from the first album, but I feel like uh, the character Rose would not have been over by the seaside on Song to a Seagull. Like, yeah. she definitely was part of this journey here. So, how do y'all feel about Rose's Blue? Again, I, I mean, you know, it's a, I, I, there are certain things about this song that I really love, and it's the construction of the verses. Yeah. Because yeah. she takes the last word of the first verse and makes it the first verse word of the second verse and so on throughout and you know it took a long time till i figured that out and it, it's just a Clever. weird yeah. thing you know and, and, it, and it, it, it's just a 
weird poets poem structure to the song yeah. i think works you know yeah i think it does too it's not it's not one of the ones that i go back to a lot on the album but i like it and i i love the mandolin at the end i i that that has stuck in my head for years it's creepy isn't it kind of oh, it's creepy and then the whole end like the do 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 like yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i think it's a well crafted little song you know and and so i like it okay there are there are the lyrics she'll prophesy your death she won't say when i love it um and uh i love it so much i thought did she steal that <laughs> somewhere <laughs> um, uh, I feel like when Joni wrote this she's like I'm I'm being artsy here like she knew yeah, what she yeah, was doing yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and she's laying her religion on her friends that's who was aligned with Joel just kind of cracks me up <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh dear <laughs> oh, I like no, that I, she says and only by your laughter will you win. Yeah, you know? yeah. You know, it's like it's like this is this is all bullshit, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm gonna take back what I said because I don't feel like this is the pirate of parents. I feel like this is the Nathan Lafreniere. Yeah, you know, you know, it's funny to say that because it's in the same tuning. Is it really? Yeah, yeah. It's all oh. in G. Yeah, so, and it's, it's really fun to play. That's what, another reason why I lo like. Like I said about a tin, tin angel, you know, like, eh, is it a good song? I'm not sure. But then I try to play it and hello, it's a great yeah. song, you know. So I need to ask everybody, let's get down to the important stuff. Who would you rather meet in a dark alley? Rose or Nathan Lafreniere? Like if you Oh man. That's a that's a hard choice. Yeah, it's hard. I'd go with Rose. I would definitely yeah, go I'd with probably go with Rose too. I don't know. I might go with Nathan, but it depends. We'll see. I don't know. Yeah, it depends what Nathan looks like, right? Yeah. Um, before before we leave this song, and by reference, leaving the Pirates of Penance, I have a confession. I like Pirates of Penance. Oh, I were here last time. Everyone hated it, but I think it's pretty. Oh, it's you know, God help me. I think it's pretty. In fact, I think it's oh, lovely. And I, I I love the I, I love the desk cat and shit going on in there. I, mm. I just think it's a pretty song. Penance Crane needs love too. It's that's what? the one. That's the one that has that funny banshee wailing in it, isn't it? No, that's Nathan Lafreniere. Oh, that's Lafreniere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, isn't the character in Pirate of Penance, uh, Penance Crane? Penance Crane and the dancer. Yeah, yeah. the dancer. Oh, that's right. I yeah. forgot. About that. I haven't looked at that. The the yeah. note that one in a long time. I feel like the dancer <laughs> and Rose know yeah, each other. This is not. Like <laughs> so I just want to say I like it. The dancer and Rose run in the same circle. They gotta be. They gotta know each other. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I feel like these are all New York people. Like by the time Joni got over to the canyon and lays in the canyon, these people don't know each other. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. Um, Rose is the psychic who finds the body, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she does. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, do you guys need a break before we go into side two? Does anyone need a break? Yeah, I could probably use one. Okay, let me pause for a second here then. All right. All right, we're back. If you're watching this, make sure to subscribe to the Phono Giants 101 channel. I forgot to show I have the, the music book, which is the music of Joni Mitchell. And I think our friend Pearl, is that her name? From mm -hmm. the last episode, said that she's playing some music. I think it was out of this book. Mm -hmm. All right, we are here to talk about Clouds, side two, for those who remember vinyl. I guess vinyl's back now. Um, <laughs> it's, it has to be said how beautiful this cover. Like, look at that almost looks like a photograph there. Yeah. This, this is one of my favorite Joni Mitchell album covers. How do y'all feel about the cover? I guess we didn't, we skipped over that. Yeah, her painting is amazing. I mean, that's supposed yeah. to be um, the river near Saskatoon. And, um, I mean, I think it is anyway. I, I'm, that's what I've been told. But and that's there's a hotel mm -hmm. in the back of it too. You're uh, yeah, I can't remember the details, but yeah, mm -hmm. you're right. Were either of you at the Mandel uh, exhibit? No, um, I have the catalog, but I didn't get to it go. Was fabulous! It was, was really absolutely, unbelievably wonderful. Yeah, yeah, and my my boyfriend. He, uh, 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 what, what do you call it? When you, we, he crashed it. 
for us. He, he crashed the smaller stuff. Oh, wow. Uh, he just said, follow me, and we and walked through the door. And I was like, oh, God, oh, God. <laughs> but it was, it was. Confessions. It was one of the moments of my life. It, it, it really was. And, and she, so I'll say, yeah, that's the river. Because it, it was right by that river. Um, oh, no kidding. And so, so the, 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 uh, this is an interlude, I'm afraid. But the, um, so the gallery where this was happening was right by the river. Um, and uh, in the, and this was a smaller reception. And Myrtle was there, and Bill was there, and Donald was there. And it, they had on a really good sound system, her music playing. And Joey was there. <laughs> <laughs> and and it was so the um, just the wide open chords of uh, I might have been taming the tiger by then I, I'm not yeah. sure I mean it was just this was wide wide open chords and just and that's the rip. that's <laughs> you know there's the Broadway Bridge you know oh, that's wow. Merle that's Merle <laughs> <laughs> it was it was wow. What Jeez. a memory! I get the chills just hearing about it. Jeez. Yeah, it was it was great. It was great, and we stayed we stayed at the best for we we thought where what well, hotel would Joey stay at? So we you know we went to the finest hotel in in Saskatoon, <laughs> and uh, and she was there, and uh, she looked at me like I was a bug. So it, it was. Oh, I met her and she was so warm and all this. I met her and she looked at me like it was a bug, but <laughs> I think she knew I had crashed. I think she knew I had crashed. Her <laughs> <reception>. <laughs> it was great. She's going to tell Rose and she's going to cast a spell on you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I want to say one nice thing about being part of the, the JMDL all these years is that. I was aware of all these things going on, even when I couldn't go. It it really has been a great community for that, especially when there's new, you know, something new coming out or some some activity going on. It's nice to be connected with everybody. I've got friends who like Joni Mitchell, but not like I do. And uh, oh, look at that! Oh, that's wow. awesome. She that's definitely the signature. Right? She didn't think you were a bug when they wrote when she wrote that. <laughs> <laughs> I feel I like uh, go go ahead. In those late, in those late ninety events, um, I did go to a couple of them, but it was always like this crazy close call, you know. That I just like I could have met her, but I didn't. Because mm -hmm. you know? I I had a press pass to uh, the uh, day at the garden, uh, the Woodstock uh, revival. Yeah. yeah. And she was supposed to have a press conference and I was uh, representing JoniMitchell.com at that point. And I went in there and I was waiting and they said, oh, Joni canceled the, oh. yeah, the press oh, wow. So I didn't get to see her. But. I feel like the late 90s, because I, I did kind of lurk the site and I, I think I emailed Wally back and forth a few times. There's a couple of pieces I wrote that he had posted. But oh, um, that was a great time to be a Joni fan. Because even yeah. though she's quitting the music industry every year, she was still putting out like great new she music. She did a lot, yeah. yeah. did a lot of stuff. And, you know, the internet was kind of new. So it was a really exciting time to be a fan. I yeah, think. Yeah, the other yeah. thing that they did yeah. was that painting with words and music that was, oh, yeah. Yeah, and it was, it was um, filmed in Burbank. And I had no money in those days. And to buy a ticket to go to LA, you know, and stay for oh, a couple yeah. of days, it was just out of my reach. And Wally was begging me to go, and I, I just, I just didn't have the money. I had to say, yeah. you know. Yeah, so, so you got to go to the the day at the garden. That was cool. That was very That's cool. A, yeah. yeah, it was great. A, I love the. I've seen the performance on YouTube that she did of "Comes Love," yeah. at that. That was really good. And Black Crow, too. That was a good one from that show. Black Crow was amazing. And she did uh, Slouching Toward Bethlehem. Oh, I love that song. I've never seen that. I love Night Ride Home. That's going to be like a 20-hour discussion. Uh, <laughs> that, that, that's one of my favorites, too. That Absolutely. Yeah. Remember, there was a contest on the, I think it was on the Joni Mitchell website, and you had to write a little essay about what Joni means to you. And if you won, you won the promo CD that was the conversation with Joni Mitchell. They had a unique painting. It was around Taming the Tiger. It was like oh, a picture of her canoe. So I won one of the CDs, so I still have it in my collection. Oh, wow. <laughs> That's cool. So I, I guess we'll be talking about that like uh, 10 months from now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. 
So speaking of being at the gallery, we're going to talk about the song <laughs> "The Gallery," which oh, wow, that's a good song. <laughs> that's my open mic hosting <laughs> abilities. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say this was never one of my favorite songs. Yeah, I'm with you there. So I feel like you know, this is kind of like the other cactus tree. Like she was the one listing the men. Now it's the man painting all the different women. <laughs> In his gallery. So what? since this wasn't one of my favorites, I'll, I'll let you all take it away. I've, I've always liked this one. Let me let me pull the lyrics up and see if something jumps out. Um, this is one of my favorites on the album, actually. Um, I like the, the rhythm of the whole thing. It's very, compared to some of the other ones on the album, it's pretty straightforward. It's first chord, it's first chord, it's first chord. It just kind of cycles along. I, I like it. Um, <laughs> Oh, the, I really, I, my favorite line is, I gave you all my pretty years, then we began to weather. And I was left to winter here while you went west for pleasure. I, that's just so, yeah. <laughs> and ironically, she was the one that went west like two years from then, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I kind of like, you know, I mean, I kind of like the codependent aspect of it too, where you yeah. know, like she's being all, the good girl and doing everything. She's dusting the paintings and doing all this stuff while he's out, you know, messing Philandering. Around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, it's like, and what, what's the last line in the song where she goes, uh, I mean, it's kind of ironic, but it's like, but I'll, I'll take care of you or something. That, what does it say? There? Oh, oh I can be gentle with you. I'll be gentle with you. Yeah. I'll be gentle. I'll be gentle with you. Even though you're a cat, I'll be gentle with you. You know, I mean, I, I don't know. I just, it reminds me of men I used to hang out with. So, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I used to be married to, actually. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. See, the first lines are uh, when I first saw your gallery, I'd, I like the ones of ladies, and that's where I would have just walked out. If he's got a painting of a lady on the wall, I'm out of there. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so you know, I I just skipped right to I think I understand. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a little. Oh, I hate to say this, but I probably will. Girly, it's I, very I girly. It is, yeah. Compared oh, to other stuff, I like it. You know, yeah, okay. yeah. yeah. Right. I kind of get, right. I kind of get that. You know, but yeah. it is yeah. kind of like kind of cringeworthy for me to think about. You know. Being that subservient in a way. Yeah, yeah. And even her harmonies on the vocals are very like chirpy, girly. Yeah. And yeah. Joni's the first one to say that she's one of the guys, I feel like. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I feel like Joni Mitchell was very fluid in her gender in some ways. You know what I mean? So, mm -hmm. this is a rare, like, very feminine, ultra feminine moment from Joni. But yeah. when you think about it, I, I'd have to think about this because it never occurred to me right now. Like, how many Joni songs are like this feminine? I, I don't know. I had to think about it and come back next month. <laughs> so I, I think you just you, um, maybe opened up a huge theme um, it, about gender fluidity I mean, because she's a stuck. I mean, not stuck, but yes, masculine and yes, feminine and push, 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 push me. You know, this this duality, but, you know, sort of stake, staking claims, but then moving back and forth between the claims. It's That's her genius. Um, genius. And no one ever did it quite like she did. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. And also, hearkening, again, I, I won't mention Pirate of Penance anymore after this. <laughs> it's so bad with the lyric. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. And that's, that's the other... Uh, another Joni genius for me that just goes all the way through her stuff. This, this, I don't know. Here, let me lay it all out for you. Let me tell you exactly what I do know and then I'll reaffirm it. I don't know. Yeah. It's great. It's so true. <laughs> you know, what's interesting too. I, just as we're talking about this, I realized that as I'm listening to these records, I'm also listening to records in the early to mid eighties by women who have carefully, who are, carefully curating their sort of public personas, Madonna and Cindy Lauper and oh. Susie Chu and all these women who, who are spending as much time on that as they are on the music 
and the art. And Joni, I don't feel like did that. And I think that's mm -hmm. one, one thing that was always kind of um, interesting to her about me was that she, she just was sort of being and not trying to create this character to present the art with the way other artists were doing. And I think that this is a good example of that. I mean, this kind of predates that whole idea, I realize, but. She was never um, worried about her brand at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, she changed so often. I mean, it was just, you know, I mean, she was just moving through so many phases, especially mm -hmm. this, you know, this is the early part, but it's only two years and then you have Blue, you know. Yeah. It's, it's quite amazing. I feel like for every Joni album, and I'm a huge Stevie Nicks fan. I feel like this about Stevie too. Her voice changed even a little bit each album where you can kind of tell what album it's from. I feel the same way about her look. Like she kind of had a, her look changed a little bit, especially like, you know, from, from how is it the same woman that did blue than Court and Spark a couple years later? Like even the way she looked and dressed and sounded, like it's hard. Yeah. Both of those. yeah. But all right. Well, any thoughts on the gallery before we leave the gallery? So we're leaving the gallery and we are going to the Wilderland of I Think I Understand. Song so much. You love the song? Is I, always... I love it. I love it too. You and know this... what's really funny about it? You know what I call this song? This is her progressive song. Like, you know, like progressive rock. <laughs> like, like, you know. Prog the, rock. The, the, yeah, the Tolkien thing that she was into and, you know, all the. I think that, you know, she even said that a lot of the lyrics from this came from her reading, you know, all those books. Um, but, but it, it, I mean, the, the lyrics are just so amazing to me. I mean, it's, it's just a, um, almost like a profiling courage of somebody just walking through fear, you know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I go. I, I've been through a lot of tough times where I can, you know, hear that song and so relate to it, you know, and like just the, just the, uh, like this is really horrible, but I'm just gonna walk through the forest anyway. You know? Sure. You know? And David, this kind of goes back to what you said. She's like, well, I think I understand. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> I, I think know, maybe uh, you know, but uh, but yeah, it's an but, older but the too. Are, like the wonder, you know. Wilderland. Yeah, I love that. This is an older one then? Did she bring this one along I'm, from you know, that's I'm really just looking at it on the website? It, this is from sixty six. Yeah. I didn't realize it was that, that much behind. Yeah. And this is on uh, the first the set of archives, isn't it? There there are early recordings of this on uh, Yeah, I have the I have the song where there's the the book here. I think it's on there. Yeah. I did schedule an episode just for the archives. That's worth that's worthy of its own episode, isn't it? Yeah. Like, oh my god. <laughs> that that has been I haven't listened to the whole thing yet. There's so much on there, it's overwhelming. I'm yeah. afraid to touch it. Yeah. yeah. There's a lot of songs there. It's <laughs> wonderful. I mean, I just listened to I think one of the first uh, CD on it, and, and it's like, oh my god. Again. again no. And again, it's like she's a genius. You know? like, well, there's one part in there, she's like. I, I wrote the song two days ago. It's it's both yeah. sides now. <laughs> it's like, oh, that okay. That's all you just wrote. I just wrote it a couple of days ago. Yeah. And I, I don't know who somebody else said this. It wasn't me, but um, saying that her her musicianship, you know, <laughs> that, that she was such a crafty musician, you know, even, even you know, really in, in her earliest work, you know? Yeah. Mm. Yeah, she's, I mean, it's almost like she came out fully formed. You know? Yeah. It's just really, like, she's 21 years old playing those old folk tunes, and everybody's just, like, staring at her going, Yeah. what the hell? You know yeah. what I love about Joni? She spent, like, 40 years saying that she's not a folk singer. Then 2020 comes along, she's like, oh, yeah, well, I was a folk singer. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, I was. <laughs> um. Plays that old baritone ukulele too, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's just so insane. You know? It's interesting to read the lyrics of "I Think I Understand" because, in the context of it being from 1966, the writing was a little bit more, maybe like some of the stuff on the first album with you know her descriptiveness and uh, the dark uncertainty. 
the shadow trembles in its wrath. So it's very, you know, like from a book. And I feel like a lot of stuff on the first album was something that could be out of a novel, more than a personal reflection. I like the the verse where she says, "Where forest, uh, forest rise to block to block the light that keeps a traveler sane." I'll challenge them with flashes from a brighter time. Mm. That's a great lyric. And to add on to what I said, e even though there is, you know, some descriptiveness, she is bringing that personal element too, yeah. which makes the fits on that. That's what makes it fit on this album to me. Um, yeah, and that's specifically a Tolkien reference. Actually, I, I, this is just from reading this on the site last night. <laughs> that, that, Im that image of in the dark forest to uh, hold up a vial of light. That, that, so that's talking. Yes. The song is so simple in some ways and so com like deep. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, uh, there's some, there's some times in my life, like I'm a little man, a little high strung, a little manic. And when I need to chill out, sometimes I'll just put on the song mm. and it, you know, I go into the wilderland and I feel better. <laughs> well, does anyone have any thoughts on uh, I think I understand before we move on? All right. Next is songs to aging children come. And I feel like I can hear where she's saying like she's trying to do the Cosby Stills and Nash harmonies a little bit, maybe in this one. Yeah, it's funny because if you listen to one of the um, recordings of um, when she played these in the cafes, she would play, she would just sing the lower register. Really? Yeah, and it sounds like a totally different song almost. Uh, it's the high, it's the high harmony that really gives this, you know, it, it's pretty distinctive in the studio version. Do you have a, which version do you prefer? Ah, it's really hard to say. I mean, I love both of them, but it's it was kind of a revelation to me of how the song was structured when I when I heard mm. heard the live version of it. You know, because I can't even picture the song without that high harmony on yeah, there. Like yeah, it's yeah. right in your face. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I yeah that did that song didn't come out in the archives. I don't think. And was this an earlier song? <laughs> yeah, it was an earlier song. Um, I think she she sang this <clears throat> around the same time that um, she was writing songs like uh, "Song to a Seagull." And, um, mm -hmm. yeah. This one says sixty-seven on the website. Sixty-seven. Mm -hmm. Seven, yeah. So that would be um, yeah. When she was doing the cafes up and down the north, the east coast, you know, she she wrote this song. She wrote um, and and this song. Do you remember the song "Carnival in Kenora? Mm -hmm. Did you ever, did you ever yeah. hear that song? Um, that was another song that she played a lot, and I think they're they're both in the same tuning. It's like an open C, although the, she plays this song in a B, like mm. she puts it down to a B, which is okay. crazy. I mean, I yeah, some of the some of her tunings start getting really different, you know, during this time period. I didn't like the song until last night. That's not true. I didn't understand the song until I was listening yeah. to it last night. And I, I mean, literally, I didn't understand it. It just seemed like image after image to me. And I didn't. And then I, then I thought, oh, songs come to aging children. <laughs> and once I read it that way, then every verse was ways in which songs come to aging children. And, and that's the first time in you know, 50 years or however long it's been, but I thought, oh, mm, I like this. That's nice. That's nice. So we all still aging children, even still? I'd say so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Get another year. <laughs> another year, come on down. <laughs> yeah, this was never one of my favorites. I, I think it was the, the high harmony that turned me off, which is why I want to hear this other version now, because I yeah. feel like I'm interested I, to I, hear... I, that too yeah i did like the call and response on the the chorus mm -hmm. it's funny this is one that i i if you'd asked me i wouldn't say i didn't like it. it's just one that sort of doesn't it never grabbed me the way some of the other ones on this record did right but whenever it comes on and i i remember the lyrics i'm like oh it, it it's it's very striking mm. It's not. It's not a throwaway by any 
That's what I love about her her albums. There there are no there's no filler on anything. Even the ones that sort of that you pass over for whatever reason, there there's no filler ever. I, I do have to say, like even when I say like it wasn't my favorite song, like I still love it. You know what I mean? Like I can play a Joni yeah. album from beginning to end. I don't skip. Even the song that's my yeah. least favorite, I like better than yeah. anything else. <laughs> And I think it's fair to say that Joni did not experience the sophomore slump with clouds <laughs> <laughs> at all. <laughs> Both sides now is on it. I know. Yeah, really. <laughs> I mean, even if that's all that was on there, what else do you need? Did these, did these sound? Does anyone, I mean, were they, how commercially successful were they? Or was she still living off of songwriting? I mean. Um, well, I think that clouds got a Grammy, didn't it? Oh, it did. Oh, You're right. Yeah. Oh, right. Wow. Okay. She started right. doing really well. And then um, I think that Ladies of the Canyon was pretty popular, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. I feel like each one kind of went up, up, and up, right? Mm -hmm. It's interesting because, like, you know, we'll get to it months from now, but that 70s work that was controversial still charted pretty high. Like, wasn't Hitting a Summer Lawns like a top five album? Mm -hmm. I think they all did well up until Mingus. I think Mingus was the one that yeah. sealed that deal. Right. Well, their loss. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, the next song, uh, I remember hearing the song when I was a teenager. And it was, it's an acapella song about war. And never in a million years did I think that this song would come back and be the theme of a ballet. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I, this song, it's, it's a protest song. It's very 60s that, you know, people were socially active. And uh, I don't want to say I thought of it as a throwaway because no Joni song's a throwaway. But I never saw it as the huge theme of her her big project that she right. did. That would circle back all those years later. I totally agree. Right. Yeah. Like, um, you know, here we let's say we're sitting in 1991. What's what's Joni? What's gonna be her main song? Sixteen years from now, the fiddle and the drum. <laughs> <laughs> uh, have you seen the uh, Dick Cavett? Um, oh yeah, show? yeah. Because because the thing about this song that does it to me is she stands there and she sings it, and 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 especially on the Cavett um, show, it, it's like whoa, you know? Oh my god. Who is this? You know? I think any artist that does an acapella song, it's pretty ballsy. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And I can't picture the song with music. I, I think it has to be just her singing. Yeah. And did she really ever do it any other time in her career? I'm on Shadows and Light a little bit, but that still had like the synthesizer in it. She sang a song. There's a song on the um, the archives called, oh, I can't remember it now. Uh, the Dewey or something. Like, wait a minute, lay that. Because she did sing it a couple times. Um, the Dowie Dens of Yarrow. Oh, uh, yeah. that was also a cappella, and mm -hmm. she sang that a couple times at some of her earlier concerts in the early seventies. You know? So, yeah, she was bold like that. And I, I think we also need to mention the key change. Like, you know, things are going along, and then all of a sudden, she jumps up a key, and she still she really belts out those last verses. This, actually, this is kind of another belter, like you were talking about um, the one earlier. The song uh, about the midway. Song about the midway. She because she kind of puts a lot into this one too, yeah. in a different way, I guess. But um, it's a confident performance. It's mm -hmm. interesting because they're both the the second to last song on the sides of the vinyl. Mm. Oh, yeah. Um, I really don't know what else to say about this song. I mean, I guess she's talking about politics, and you know, we, we won't get into that here. But the song still has its relevance. Yes. <laughs> well, I, you know, I was thinking about this the other day that Joni, you know, everybody talks about her political songs of the '80s, right? You know, but she was very political from the get-go. I mean, I even think a song like "Cactus Tree" is a very political song. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah, I could that. see that. Very, mm -hmm. I mean, it's very, it was very, um, it was something women didn't sing about. Right. In it's days. daring. I feel it was daring for, as a female, to be so forthcoming. 
exactly yeah so she was always pretty and she was also very political with her um you know like the uh with big yellow taxi and the um yeah. climate bank with you know, bank her, 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 bank her, her, yeah you know, conservation mm -hmm. i mean that was that was very early when people started talking about that i would think you know so we the only people in the world that are going to put fiddle in the drum in the the three great stimulants in the same category <laughs> 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 Why not? Why not? Oh, I love it's the thing. Right. Right. Yeah. That's so funny. <laughs> well, there comes more thumbs down on my podcast. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have nothing else to say about the film, the drum. I does anyone is jo Joni singing a little bit now, right, with her friends pre-COVID? That's what I read. Yeah. <laughs> I do. I do anything to be in that room. <laughs> Been little snippets of videos on online. Really? Yeah. Her, she had a New Year's Eve party, and um, you know there were a lot of pe people there. Like Eric Idle was there playing music. He was playing. Yeah. He was playing. Oh, music. Right. Yeah, it was really funny. Could you wow. hear Joni singing in the background? Um, they said she did, but there was no, uh, I don't think there was any video of that, but. Cause I remember she said she was never going to sing again, but before the aneurysm, she had the, what was the birthday party where she came out and sang a couple songs. She started talking, but then furry sings the blues when she's, she's like, oh, actually, I'm oh wow. That was amazing. David was there, right? You were there. Oh, wow. you were? oh God. That was the most amazing concert mm. ever. Cause she went up there, she's like, "I'm, I'm gonna talk." Then she's like, "Oh, actually, I'm gonna sing." Like she just yeah. went right into it. When she started singing, I was like, "The water." I started crying for at home. Yeah, yeah. It she was did. Crazy. She did something other than "Furry Sings the Blues" that night too, didn't she? She wrote a a poem called "The Rain," right, mm -hmm. right, which was about this artist from British Columbia. It was mm -hmm. amazing. And then she did. Um, did she do "Don't Interrupt the Sorrow"? But it's not yeah, online. Yeah, and they didn't. They didn't release it. And That's that, what I. That yeah, that, that, I would love to hear that yeah. one. Yeah. yeah. Were you there? Did you hear it? Yeah. yeah. How was it? It was It was incredible. It was. It was. That song is. That's another song that is just. You know. Unbelievable! Un it is. Yeah. Unbelievable! Mm -hmm. So great. Yeah. That's. Yeah. That's there's times when Joni reaches a level that no one else can reach, and I think that's one of those cases like no one can touch that. Yeah, and I searched for hours for that. I wanted to hear her sing, uh, Don't Interrupt the Sorrow. And two, what was that, 2013? Actually, got yeah. we're talking about this right now. Yeah, oh, that song. I love that song. We can't help skip ahead, we can't help ourselves. <laughs> but the thing about Joni is that it really is a whole body of work, so you can't talk about one without referencing other stuff. I know, yeah, because it's it, there's some songs that are precursors to some yeah. of her better stuff, you know. Yeah. And, you know, it's just so so incredible. So one. <laughs> we're uh, we're coming to the end of the album. Uh, I feel like we could talk about both sides now for like hours. One of her standards, Judy Collins, is the one that made it popular first, right? Yeah. I like Joni's version the best. I really do. <laughs> I, I prefer Judy's version, but it's because I heard it so much earlier, I think, and it it's just Do you have a memory attached to it? Yeah, there's a there's a whole thing attached to it. But um it's even even the schmaltziest covers of this are good. It's just a great song. It really is. And who's our friend that was here? I'm terrible with names. That he knows about all the cover verses. Was it Jim? Oh, Bob. Uh, Bob. Bob. Yeah, where's Bob? He'd be franchise. If he was here right now, he'd be like, there were five thousand covers of <laughs> oh it should say here actually um so bob we miss you <laughs> i thought he'd be here tonight because yeah. i love i loved all his uh every song he'd say how many people did the covers i oh, that's so intriguing is. he's put it on he's put it on johnny yeah. 1422 <laughs> oh my gosh how many covers of roses blue were there <laughs> We look. I'm guessing one, maybe. <laughs> I'm, I'm usually wrong. Uh, transcriptions. No. So you covers. better release the cover version. The one cover yeah, I, covers of roses. I, I have roses blue on the on my uh, YouTube page. Oh, awesome! I have an instructional video in there. Yeah, so everyone definitely at the end will. I'll give our links and stuff so we can share our work. Well, 
I'm, I still want to do a cover of Patrika Plains with uh, Chris. Oh my Capone. gosh, I was there when you did that. Yeah, well, I want to do it actually well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do it correctly, sort of. Yeah. What, are you, what, what are you talking about? Patrika Plains. Oh, yeah, he wow. Read, he the 17-minute, like, you know, tone poem. Yeah. Yeah, yeah he, he, he read the, uh, the, the middle poem. Oh, the, you did? On the, yeah. on, the, yeah. on the album cover. I always like that part. Oh, really it together really quickly, and I'm, I'm afraid it showed. But and so I, I really would like to do it well. Yeah, anyway, was, that was Ithaca 2022. No, yeah. listen, you Be have there. about you have about six episodes to get it together so you can perform it live okay. on, the, there you go. Right. on okay. the Don Juan's podcast. Okay. Get ready, start practicing. <laughs> okay, I don't even know what to say about both sides now. Like it's it's. A song far beyond her years of wisdom, or mm. not. Like, yeah. she. I, I okay. I totally said that wrong. It shows how advanced she was at a young age. Yeah, for sure. And of course, she re-recorded it in two thousand. It became the title track of her first orchestral album. Mm -hmm. Um, I probably in the minority. I didn't love the orchestra revisiting stuff. Oh, right wow. I'm the exact opposite. I, I liked it okay. I mean, I thought it was an okay song. And when I first played that orchestral thing, I broke down. I, oh, my God. Oh I love that. This is completely off topic. Yeah. But for oh. me, the best revisiting ever was when Marianne Faithful went back to As Tears Go By. <laughs> I was going to say that, actually. I think that's that's an equally as powerful. Yeah after yeah oh my gosh and you know both Joni and Marianne both I'd say their vote you know their voice dropped an octave so you have that the sound and then the experience so you know I'm gonna have to go back because I haven't listened to those orchestra albums since they came out probably so you know maybe if I listen now I'm 46 and I lived a little so Joni's music will hit you a different time so I have a few months before we get to those episodes <laughs> <laughs> I, at the time, I was I got more into the Both Sides Now album than I did Travelogue. I should listen to Travelogue some more. Mm -hmm. I have some time before the podcast, but yeah, um, I waited a couple I, years I just, before I listened to Travelogue, and I really, really liked it a lot. The first time I listened to it when it first came out, I wasn't really too crazy about it, but it I just like that she did the Dawn Treader on there. Like that's the least likely song I thought she'd revisit. That to me was worth the price of admission right there. That the, the fact that she pulled that one out all those years later. And it was fantastic. great. Beautiful. And it was good. Yeah. I, I remember like the, the, the for, version like, uh Be Cool. Yeah. You know, that kind of that kind of rocked, you know, even though it was, oh, it was really good. <laughs> the version of Hajira, uh, Hajira rattled me though. I couldn't I, <laughs> I've I've heard the original so many times I just couldn't I couldn't listen to it. Yeah, I get that. It was interesting. Her, I you know, of course, here we are jumping ahead, but like I said, we can't help ourselves. When I saw the track yeah. list of the songs that she, it was an interesting choice of songs that she did for that. Mm -hmm. it was there was definitely some curveballs, and I'd say it was more hit than miss. Even though it wasn't my favorite yeah. era of hers, I, I appreciate it for what it was. Mm -hmm. Can I jump back for a minute to the last one? Um, did you all talk about, I didn't watch the, the recording. I read an article and Brian Blade was quoted that he had been working with Joni before her aneurysm on, he was recording drums that she wanted to go back and, and re reproduce the first album. He was putting drum tracks down to the original tracks. They were in, they had gotten started and then she had the aneurysm and he said, I don't know if that'll ever see the light of day, but wouldn't that be fascinating? Wow, that if you really pulled that record out, I'll, I'll pull that up and email it to everybody. Um, I just wondered if that had come up in that discussion. No, it uh, didn't. This is the first I've ever heard of that. And I'm intrigued. Isn't that cool? I, I just can't imagine what that would sound. Like. I feel like before I mean, her aneurysm, I remember David Geffen saying that he was gonna, she was going to do a live performance of all of Court and Spark. Do y'all uh, remember reading that? No, no. See all these rumors. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, it might be. She was always thinking of the next thing. That's for sure. Yeah, it was I, the first time I'd heard. He he quoted her as saying, Brian Blade quoted her as saying that um, Crosby had fucked up the first album. That was the first time I'd heard her. 
say anything quite that negative about it. She, well, she, she was usually a little more uh, kinder, but so she, she had decided to go back and fix it. And I figured, well, it'll either be a revelation or it will just be not. <laughs> and, uh, but what, what, a, what a cool thing to take, to take something from that early in her career and, and try and redo it just to tinker with it. That's crazy. So she wasn't uh, going to redo Bush the vocals. Did. Just, just, uh, no, different. I think it's just, just the, the product, some of the production and add the drum tracks. So she's pulling a Madonna love. Don't live here anymore. Something to remember. Remix. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then um, Kate Bush did that with some of her director's she did a cut whole album uh, director's cut. Yep. And it, you know, some of it was really interesting, but again, I, I was so with Kate Bush. It's, it's kind of like Joni. I, I got so stuck on the original versions that I had a hard time listening to a couple of the the redos, although they were really interesting. And there's definitely a Kate Bush Phonogenics series in the future. So that sounds great. Yeah, stick with me, y'all. <laughs> For many years, there's so much oh, music to talk I would, about. I love yeah. love Kate Bush, and this is so off topic, but you know, if people made it this far, I feel like her last album was one of her best, "The Fifty Words for Snow." Oh, me too. I loved that. What in a masterpiece. Okay, back to back to both sides now. I, I'm so sorry, everybody. <laughs> well, about, about um, redoing her, and, and whether I want to hear, you know, um, her 70-year-old take on the stuff that happened 50 years ago. J Joni, every step, every album, she, I had to catch up with her. You know, every album, I she taught me how to listen to it, you know. So, um, yeah, I'll, and even Shine, I will say, <laughs> you know, even Shine, suddenly I thought, oh, oh, there is. See, I, I loved Shine from the moment. Yeah, I, 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 I take it in doses, but at least I can take it in doses. Right. Now, you know, so, um, so I would love to hear what. The, 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 what she thinks of this stuff now. Yeah. I'm interested to hear where the archives project goes. You know, is it going to be 30 volumes or like five? I have no idea. Well, and now they get it. Outtakes from, um, you know, certain albums that she might, you know, there's all those hissing demos. Oh, I love that, those. That, that came out. Them. So, yeah. And then, um, um, the Mingus tapes the Mingus stuff, and maybe there's even outtakes of Don Juan's Reckless Daughter or Hijira or be neat. Yeah, Paprika Plains, the 45 minute version. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> where she actually says the poem. Wouldn't that be something if that existed? <laughs> um, I don't know what else to say about both sides now. Just, I mean, it's such a wise song. Who else covered it besides Judy Collins? Everybody, everybody, right. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. I'm trying to I think want, of one. I want to say in all my open mic years, I don't know if anyone ever showed up and did this song. It was always a case of you. Mm. So you know what? There were a lot of um, people who came at certain um, shows that I've been to that were, jo you know, Joni themed so uh, shows that came to sing Both Sides Now and always fucked up the lyrics. Oh. <laughs> How I mean, dare I they? It amazing. I mean, I was down in New Orleans for a pass fest, you know, and um, these these accomplished New Orleans musicians would come out and sing it and always screw up the lyrics. Oh. I don't know why. I mean, and, and was there a particular lyric that they screwed up? Excuse me. Was there a particular lyric that they screwed up, or? Well, I mean. I think that what happens when you sing this song is that there's, when I sing it, I have to really concentrate on, you know, the second verse is moons and Junes. Yeah. The yeah. third verse is tears and fears. Mm -hmm. And, you know, sometimes those phrases get mixed up in your yeah. head because sure. it's like, it's like there's a, sure. there's a, there's a rhythm to it, but you, Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I used to tell people when I was teaching them so the songs is that the the lyrics and the way that the lyrics, um, you know, the, the rhythm of the lyrics are part yeah. of the music, you know, yeah. and even though, you know, and, and they're and they're very gorgeous poetry, too. 
So if you're playing an instrument, you're singing the song. I mean, I have to practice this stuff over and over and over and over again. I actually get up every morning and play a Joni Mitchell song so that I can, you know, get it into my head and huh. and and get the lyrics right because it. I mean, when the lyrics are, when you get all the lyrics right, it's like the whole song comes together. You know? It's interesting how she compartmentalized the the human experience mm -hmm. into these three ver. You know, first it's clouds. Yeah. Then it's love. Then it's yeah. life. Like, yeah. and it's like the up and down, give and take, win and lose. Yeah, yeah. You know? it's yeah. like it's just so amazing. I mean, yeah. it's, you know, it's not. She did the same thing with Circle Game in a way. You know, what I mean, yeah. just how she made everything make sense. She made the whole <laughs> little experience make yeah. sense in a few <laughs> verses. Uh, I had to take issue though. When did the comma come along? Because sometimes it's both sides now, then sometimes it's both sides comma now. Have you guys known? <laughs> well, the commas in the in the uh, in the foldout. Is there a comma in the foldout? Is it on yeah. the art? Yeah, I wondered. I'm hmm. I'm a no comma guy. I like my both sides now without the comma. <laughs> and I think I think in in uh, uh, I'm I'm on the website now. Um, in the things she calls it from both sides now. Early on, she calls it from. Oh, yeah. It's think. always interesting when Joni introduces a live song. She'll she'll have like her own title. That's like, yeah. is it for free or real good for free? <laughs> <laughs> and we're jumping ahead again. Um, <laughs> do we have any thoughts on both sides now or clouds before Sue treats us to a version of that song? Are we doing that song about about oh, the midway? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nice. I'd love yeah. this for it to be a tradition for the Joni podcast to end with someone doing a song. Well, here, let me. I'm just gonna plug in my guitar. Cool. And we'll see how the how the sound is. This has been a just a great time. So thank you all, you know, for your yeah. for your time and thoughts. It's uh, before Sue uh, starts, I do say I have one more thing to say about both sides. Now it's just the now. <laughs> the, um, it's just the now that that the again this is this is like um one of the things about Joni that this just does it for me over and over again it's like you know okay big things both sides both sides now uh the, 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 the way that she goes back and forth between very particular narrative you know moments crystalline moments to these big ideas so anyway I like the, I like the now in both sides now yeah I'd say that uh Clouds is a, and she does this kind of that belting voice in both sides now that she kind of did in uh, Fill in the Drum and that song about the Midway. There's a confidence here that I think is mm -hmm. unique to this album over the first one. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I absolutely love it. Well, thank you all so much for this discussion. We're coming back to Ladies in the Canyon next month. And let's uh, subscribe to my page. I'm Jeremy Gloff on Facebook. If anyone wants to join my Patreon, that's awesome. And we are going to end with a performance from Sue on her birthday. So happy birthday, Sue. <laughs> happy birthday, Thank you Sue. so much. <laughs> How does that sound? Beautiful. I met you on a midway At a fair last year Stood out like a ruby in a black man's ear. You were playing on the horses, you were playing on the guitar strings, you were playing like a devil wearing wings. Wearing wings, you look so grand. Found you in 
Made me start crying over here. <laughs> oh, my oh, goodness. Oh. Oh. <laughs> oh. Mm. oh my gosh. Gorgeous. You just forget how you know how much these songs just meant to you your whole life. Like these oh, songs I know it. oh, I gotta stop talking. <laughs> so great. I'm gonna pause it so we can keep talking for a moment. Okay. I will see everybody. Well, thank you. Ladies of the Canyon next month. 